Having looked at psychological explanations for anorexia nervosa in the last video, we're going to go on to finish off by looking at biological explanations. And as you can see on the specification, that's the last bullet point there. So biological explanations for anorexia nervosa, uh, they are split into two main categories. So there's neuro or neural uh, explanations, um, and we're going to look at neurochemicals such as serotonin and dopamine. And then there's evolutionary explanations um, and looking at anorexia from the evolutionary perspective. Um, so without further ado, we'll look into some AO1 um, for the explanations and then we'll go, we'll finish off with your evaluation, your AO2 and IDA points. As you can see here, the first neural explanation is from neurotransmitters and in particular serotonin. Okay, so the idea is that disturbances in serotonin levels um, have been linked to anorexia and in particular high levels of serotonin, so anxiety anxiety, um, not causing but related neurochemicals, so serotonin is related to anxiety. Um, and Baylor et al in 2007 looked at people with different types of anorexia. So they looked at those with a restricting type, so those are individuals who have anorexia and obviously they restrict their diet very much to control their weight. There's another subgroup of anorexics known as binge purge type, um, who in the binge will obviously uh, eat a, a lot of food, a lot of calories, but then in the purge we'll try and get rid of that in, in any way, so lots of different ways, uh, over-exercising, um, laxatives, um, lots of different ways, so they're, they're different types of anorexics, and they had a healthy control group who didn't have anorexia, and what they did, they tested uh, the serotonin levels of these groups, and what they found was that the binge purge group had higher levels of serotonin, um, and they also found that those with the highest levels of anxiety about anorexia had the highest levels of serotonin. So it does suggest there that high levels of serotonin are certainly linked to anxiety, uh, and obviously this anxiety is linked to the eating behaviour uh, and eating disorder. Um, it must be noted though that obviously this is a correlation, so we don't know that there's any direct effect of serotonin on anorexia and as that bullet point there suggests it could be actually that the serotonin affects the anxiety and it's the anxiety that is affecting the anorexia so we're not saying here that serotonin has a direct effect on anorexia but it's a, it's almost a third variable um, that that is leading eventually to the disorder So the second neurotransmitter that is thought to be involved with anorexia nervosa is dopamine. Um, and actually it's suggested that increased dopamine activity uh, has some sort of role to play with anorexia nervosa. Um, this was studied by K. et al. Uh, 2005. Um, and in this study they gave PET scan, um, positron emission tomography, um, basically a brain scan to people, 10 women, females, who were recovering from anorexia nervosa. And they compared this to 12 brain scans from uh, healthy controls. And what they found was that there was, yeah, this increased um, activity, the dopamine receptors uh, seemed to be kind of overactive in the basal ganglia. Um, and this area and, and the dopamine in this area is to do with interpreting harm and pleasure. So what it was saying was that those with anorexia nervosa weren't getting the same kind of pleasure signals as people without anorexia nervosa. And obviously that would be to do with things things like food as well. So they weren't getting the pleasure from eating food that most people would associate. And that would obviously make sense in terms of uh, the restricted diet and, uh, and not eating as much. Um, and so that's how dopamine could potentially have a role to play in anorexia nervosa. So it's those two, it's the serotonin, the high levels of serotonin and increased activity of dopamine um, are the neural explanations uh, and explain how neurotransmitters can be associated with uh, anorexia. 
The second part of the biological explanation for anorexia comes from the evolutionary perspective. Uh, and there are a couple of theories here um, to suggest that actually having anorexia nervosa could have become or could have been an adaptive advantage. It would have allowed people to survive in their environment. It sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but when you start looking into it, um, it does make a bit of sense. So the first of those was the re uh, reproductive suppression hypothesis. Um, so this was um, the work of Serby, 1987. Um, and the idea here was that actually what um, happens with girls who have anorexia nervosa is often uh, their periods and their reproductive um, capabilities are suppressed, are, are reduced um, when they are in a state of anorexia and very, very low weight. Um, what that means is that actually um, it would allow the, the female to wait until a time in which she would have a better chance of bringing up her offspring. So obviously if a female is low in weight, that suggests maybe um, there's low resources or kind of socially or even emotionally that the female not, might not be ready to, to bear offspring. And if she were to bear offspring in that state, there's a less chance, a, a, less, a lesser likelihood of that offspring surviving. And so what it would suggest is this is an adaptive advantage. The, the females would only then uh, reproduce when the, the, the situation is right, when their body's ready for it, when they're, they're socially in a good place, when they're emotionally in a good place. Um, and so in, on, in that side of things, it does make sense um, in relation to the, the evolutionary perspective. Um, so the, this theory was um, derived from looking at actually other species, and other species do this. Other species, when the environment's not right, when when the female of the species um, isn't in a fit state, they they suppress uh, their reproductive system and their their reproductive capabilities until a time where it's correct. So this is almost applied to to humans uh, and applied to anorexia nervosa. Um, and again, it, it, it does make sense, and it does have adaptive um, adaptive processes and would ensure the offspring survival. Um, and so it, it suggests that anorexia nervosa is a distorted variation uh, of this behaviour in humans. Um, so it's quite an interesting thought, and, and we'll look uh, later on at some maybe AO2 uh, evaluation that can suggest whether that is a correct thing to be thinking or not. The second evolutionary approach, um, again obviously because it's an evolutionary approach, um, suggests that anorexia nervosa could have provided some sort of some sort of adaptive advantage um, to those who had the disorder and obviously we're left with anorexia nervosa now as almost a, a hangover from uh, evolutionary times. This second theory is known as the adapted to flee famine hypothesis uh, and what this suggests, uh, this was from Geisinger, is that actually restricting food um, and denial of starvation, both of which are obviously characteristics of anorexia nervosa, people with anorexia restrict the amount of food they have, they deny how hungry they are, that actually would have allowed for um, migration uh, and in evolutionary times, that would have been a good thing in terms of uh, finding food and resources. So in times when there wasn't much food or resources around, it would have allowed those who are able to do that, those that are able to restrict their food and deny starvation, they would have been the ones who moved around um, and were able to survive long enough until they were then able to get more food and resources. Whereas the ones that weren't able to do that may not have migrated um, and may have died off. So actually it would have been an adaptive advantage um, to be able to, to have those sorts of behaviours. Um, again, much like the uh, first evolutionary perspective, this has got support from other species. Other species do this um, if, they, if they're able to um, deny themselves food, they're able to migrate um, and, and that provides some sort of uh, advantage. 
Um, and another aspect that, that relates to this theory is the fact that we have certain instinctual drives. Um, some of them are to migrate, some of them are to breed, some of them are to eat and find food. And if you can obviously turn one of those off, eating and finding food, um, it would then allow you to focus on the other two. So focus on migrating, focus on breeding. Uh, and again, that may have been advantageous in times where food was scarce. So you'd still be reproducing. That may go slightly against, obviously, the first evolutionary theory. But importantly, this one is all about the, the migration uh, and able to, to, to move to areas that, that would have been beneficial. Having looked at the different AO1 biological approaches to anorexia then, um, including the, the neural mechanisms and evolutionary explanations, we now need to then start looking at some evaluation, some AO2, and seeing whether these theories hold up or not. So first we'll look at serotonin um, and see if there, there's any supporting or contradictory evidence for, for the role of serotonin in anorexia nervosa. Well, one of the contrary or weaknesses, AO2 points, um, is that SSRIs tend to be ineffective. Now, SSRIs are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and what they do is they increase the overall amount of serotonin that's available in the system. Um, they don't produce any more. They do this by blocking what's known as reuptake. So it's a, a neuron um, taking some of the serotonin back to, to store it for, for the next transmission. Um, and the fact that they tend to be ineffective, the fact that SSRIs don't work, actually goes against the serotonin theory because the idea of uh, serotonin is that there, there's not enough serotonin in the system and that could potentially cause um, anorexia. That's what the theory would suggest. So the fact that the SSRIs are ineffective, that goes against that theory, doesn't it? Because if you're increasing the amount of serotonin that's available uh, and low levels of serotonin are the cause of anorexia nervosa, you'd expect um, anorexia to, or anorexia type symptoms to be reduced and that's not the case. K et al, Okay, it's not Kanye, but it's the closest I could get, Soz. Um, K et al. found that SSRIs did actually have some sort of effect um, in preventing relapse of anorexia nervosa. So almost halfway through or, or towards the end of um, treatment, um, if anorexia nervosa patients uh, were taking SSRIs then, um, it would stop them going back into um, gaining... Uh, anorexia type symptoms again. So that actually suggests, well, maybe it's not this straight um, relationship between serotonin and anorexia. Something else must be going on, might be going on then. Um, and actually it might be that, well, the fact that SSRIs don't work straight away, it could be to do with the malnourished state that the body is in um, with anorexia nervosa. And actually when patients have got a bit better, um, and their body weights come up and they're not as malnourished, the SSRIs work better. Um, and so it, it's a difficult one. It's not black and white. It's not saying, yep, yeah, this is this is causing anorexia or, or it's not. It's saying that there's some sort of interaction with serotonin um, and actually, well, the treatment, the SSRI treatment only tends to work when the body's not in this malnourished state, when actually the, the patient's a bit healthier again. And so it's more a treatment of preventing relapse than it necessarily would be uh, the first thing that you would go to as a treatment for anorexia um, straight away. The second neural theory we looked at uh, involving neurotransmitters was dopamine, if you remember. Um, for the AO1, it was suggested that overactive dopamine receptors uh, had a role to play in the perception of kind of um, pleasure um, and pain and um, identifying harm. And so the theory, again, if you remember, was that uh, those with anorexia nervosa had, that, had this higher um, increased activity of dopamine and so were maybe 
sensing more harm than pleasure for, from eating food. So when we come to evaluate that then, we then need to look, well, is that the case? Is there any supporting uh, or contrary research for this? Um, and it turns out there does tend to be a fair bit of support actually. Um, so Castro Fenelas et al, um, they did find this. They found that adolescent girls with anorexia had higher levels of what they called homo vanillic acid. Uh, and homo vanillic acid is a waste product of dopamine. Um, so it does suggest that if there's obviously more of this waste product, it suggests there's more dopamine. And that would support this idea that this overactive dopamine levels uh, in anorexics are found. Um, and what they did find as well was that actually if you had, so they found higher homo vanillic acid uh, was associated with anorexia. What they also found was that if you had normalized levels of homo vanillic acid, this was also related to, to normal, normalized weight levels. Um, so it does seem that there is this link between uh, dopamine levels and um, whether uh, people have anorexia or not. Further support came from Wang et al. <laughs> Wang. Uh, Wang et al. who found actually that there were lower levels of dopamine with obese individuals. So we're looking at the other end of the spectrum now. So what we're saying is if you've got overactivity of dopamine, uh, that tends to lead to weight loss. And then this is looking at the other side of it. This is saying, well, if you've got lower levels of this dopamine, um, it tends to lead to weight gain. So that, that adds weight to the theory. <laughs> Excuse the pun. Uh, that adds support to the theory um, that dopamine does have this role to play in, in anorexia. The only issue that we do find, obviously, with the, the dopamine theory is this cause and effect. So we don't know whether differentiated different levels of dopamine activity are causing anorexia or whether those individuals with anorexia have got this increased activities and and quite like Wang <laughs> Wang has suggested that obese individuals have got this lower level we don't know what what came first whether it was the the change in the dopamine level has affected weight either lower or higher, depending on whether you're looking at anorexia or, or obesity, or whether the weight change has actually then led to the, the change in the dopamine. So we haven't got this cause and effect. We can't say that, yep, having this different dopamine level is actually causing anorexia. Uh, and that's an issue with the, the dopamine theory. We'll continue the evaluation looking at the evolutionary approaches um, and if you remember, there were two of them. So first off was the reproductive suppression hypothesis, um, which suggested that anorexia um, may have been evolutionary advantageous because it would have allowed females to control um, when they were in a good place to reproduce, be that uh, emotionally, um, you know, physically, uh, economically, can they provide resources to raise a young child? Um, and this is kind of backed up by the idea that, that menarche, which is the, the onset of puberty, um, the, the, the begin of the first menstrual cycle, um, that is delayed with girls with anorexia nervosa. Um, and as is the fact that amenorrhea, which is um, inability to have a period, that is also found in anorexics. And these biological findings back up this idea that, that reproductive suppression could be maybe one of the reasons behind uh, anorexia um, being found. Uh, so that's kind of support for one of the first evolutionary theories. The second evolutionary theory was the adaption to flea famine hypothesis. Um, remember, so this is saying that um, anorexia is would have been evolutionary advantageous because it allowed those individuals with anorexia to to migrate and find food sources and be happy with with a lower weight while they do that, so they can focus on the migrating rather than the eating. That was the theory. That was the AO1. Well, is there any support for this? Um, Support, maybe not, but actually if you if you take this view into account, it's actually been found to be really beneficial in therapy. Um, and so actually if you if you uh, suggest this theory um, and the fact that actually there are really strong biological uh, reasons here for um, individuals with anorexia 
not eating. Um, it actually can make the 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 therapy and the the therapeutic relationship between uh, therapist, the the patient, and especially the family, it can make that a bit better because actually the family might then realise and understand. Well, actually, no, maybe it takes away maybe some of the family family uh, familial blame. So you're not blaming the family, you're not blaming the upbringing, you're not blaming the parenting which maybe the, the psychological approach does do in some cases, but you're saying actually no, they're, they're biological reasons here, and actually it can, it can take some of that burden off uh, and allow people to maybe focus on helping the individual get better rather than trying to attribute where the blame is. So that's one of the benefits, although it's not necessarily directly backing up the theory in itself, it is still a strength of that uh, theory because it can help in, in applications. The big issues that come from the evolutionary perspective, well, one is kind of unfalsifiability. I guess we'll, we'll never be back in, in the same situation, so we can't prove whether these, these theories are correct or not. Um, but for me, the, the biggest issue is that these theories claim to be adaptive. They claim that anorexia nervosa was of benefit and it allowed people to survive. Well, actually, if you look at individuals with the symptoms who have been diagnosed, it's clearly not adaptive. This is not a good thing for these people to be going through. Um, it probably wouldn't have been passed on through natural selection because how could, well, one of the theories is saying that you're reducing um, re reproductive capabilities and so how can that be passed on how can that be beneficial and actually in extreme cases um, it can af permanently damage fertility so individuals who have had anorexia and have their fertility damage that's obviously not going to be be able to be passed on and people die from anorexia and so it's not a beneficial um, set of characteristics to have and so that almost flies in the face of this evolutionary advantageous, it would have been a good thing to have. Well, clearly not. If you actually look at someone um, with the disorder, it's not beneficial for that, that person. And that would go probably for, for both of those evolutionary explanations, both reproductive suppression and the adapted to flee famine hypothesis, um, probably the biggest weakness of, of each of those. Finally, we'll finish up by looking at some IDA points, issues, debates and approaches as you need to for the top mark band of the PSYA3 paper. Uh, the first thing that we can look at is real world applications. Um, this one's maybe a bit more unlikely uh, and maybe one that you, you wouldn't necessarily have thought about, but actually this has become um, or could potentially become a real issue in America um, where Actually, there's very little uh, national health service uh, and a lot of the health care is paid out through insurance companies. Now, these insurance companies say that they will only pay out for conditions which are biological in nature. Um, and so quite often, a lot of the insurance insurers won't pay out for psychological disorders um, unless it could be proved that there is a biological basis for them. So schizophrenia, they would pay out for because there's a lot of scientific research into the biological basis of schizophrenia. However, at the moment, anorexia nervosa wouldn't come under that category. They wouldn't pay out for treatment. But based on this theory or these theories and, and the evidence that support them, then maybe there is a case for, for that being changed. Um, and well, I don't, I don't know what the, the state of play is in Britain at the moment, but I'm sure if there's private healthcare, again, this might come into play. Um, and so that's a real world application. What, why is it important to look at these theories and explanations? Well, it could affect people day to day and, and the treatment they actually get based on how we classify this disorder and, and how we explain how people have got it. So that's one thing, real world applications. And then finally, it's gender bias. Um, and it's believed that nowadays, 25% uh, of all anorexia patients uh, are male. And so a quarter of, of those with the disorder are counted for as male. That never used to be the case. It used to be probably initially considered a female only um, disorder. Then um, more and more men uh, were, were diagnosed with the issue. They, they, in the tabloid and media, there was this term called manorexia for, for males with the disorder. Um, whether that is because more males are being 
I have actually got the disorder and are gaining the disorder, or whether that's because more males are now happy to come forward, that, that's still up for debate, but it is nowadays considered about 25% of patients are male. That being the case, theories and treatments that focus on women don't obviously account for men. Um, and so there is a gender bias here in, in explanations, in treatments, uh, uh, and how we go about talking about this disorder, especially if you talk about maybe the, the um, reproductive suppression hypothesis. That obviously wouldn't be the case uh, for males because of the menstrual cycle issue. Um, and so the issue here is that, yeah, there's potentially a bias in the way that we talk about this disorder, the way we go about treating the disorder, and maybe more focus now needs to be uh, placed on looking at the, the male form of the disorder. Okay, so that's pretty much it for um, the biological explanations of anorexia, and pretty much it for the eating disorders um, topic. Um, if you have any questions, please post in the comments on any of the videos. Um, don't forget to subscribe um, and as always a thank you to the the information that I've used um, for reference and again you should be using when, when reading up about these um, topics uh, the Cara Flanagan and Mark Cardwell uh, complete companion book uh, and resourced um, the, the reference for psychology teachers thank you and until next time goodbye